All right, welcome to the Real Estate Investing School podcast. I'm your host, Joe Jensen. I've got our guest today, Joe Farron. So double the Joes for you guys today. Um, Joe grew up in southern Idaho before moving to Boise to attend Boise State University to study mechanical engineering. While there, he started learning about real estate, eventually getting his first deal and continuing to do real estate while he worked as an engineer for six years or so before quitting to become a builder slash developer where they actually build multi-unit rental properties, which I'm super excited to learn about that idea. I love the idea of new build rentals. Obviously anybody who's bought older properties and dealt with the headaches there and the kind of tenant class there, the idea of having cash flowing brand new stuff is super sexy and exciting. And I wanna learn how he's been able to make that work. So without further ado, welcome to the show, man. How you doing? good man how are you Um, thanks for having me on i really appreciate it yeah stoked to hear your story um and dig into some of this so so you you own um or work at j2 homes tell us a little bit about your business and then we'll go backwards and bring us to speed to catch us back up yeah sounds good yeah so uh my wife and i started j2 homes almost two years ago um yeah so kind of like you said in my bio um I was at Boise State studying uh, mechanical engineering and was working in the corporate uh, engineering environment. And um, through that time, just really got the bug for real estate. And, um, you know, through through working and owning some deals and stuff like that, uh, my wife's family and I ran across a property back in our hometown in southern Idaho, uh, where there were 17 lots for sale. Um, they had a family kind of emergency. There was a, a reason their family needed to liquidate some assets. And, and we, we knew the family personally. Um, and so we decided let's, let's go ahead and buy those lots and do something with it. Um, and we hired a builder originally to do some stuff, but then as we kind of progressed through the project a little bit, um, my engineering job just started to wear more and more. And we're like, man, like, why don't I just go do this? You know, like my engineering yeah. job is designing big food plants and, producing construction drawings and managing construction crews and stuff is like, do you think we could do, do it in the residential world? Let's, let's give it a whirl. So, uh, we started that in April of 2020, um, and basically dove right in to, uh, build multifamily to rent two to four units. I love that. That's super cool. So do you, do you build multifamily to rent for other investors or just kind of for your own portfolio? So right now we've been doing mainly for our own portfolio and kind of friends and family. Sure. Uh, we kind of took this on as a big family project and that's what we've been doing. Had some other investors reach out, but at this time with the interest rates and stuff, you know, it really, at this point, it, it's hard to justify paying a builder to build for you. You kind of got to do it yourself, you know? So that's, that's the strategy we've taken thus far. I love that, man. And, and I, whenever I talk with my students, I'm always like, hey, you need to find like what I call your unfair advantage. You know what I mean? Like what's your mm-hmm. unfair advantage or your competitive edge or, uh, you know, I think Mendez calls it your superpower. You know, all these people have these different phrases for like what's something that you could take advantage of. And, and that's super cool that you're able to look at your situation, look at your family connections, look at your degree and what you know how to do. Like, dude, let's just do this. We'll right. have an, an unfair advantage that most people can't do. Exactly. Um, and, and that's, that's really cool. So those 17 lots, I want to dive into that. I do want to go back to your first deal. I was love hearing about first deals, but, but let's talk about these. So you, you buy these 17 lots, are these completely undeveloped? I mean, do they have utilities roads? What, what's the situation with these lots? And, uh, and then what's been the process from the, let's just do the whole thing from concept to cash flow of, of this, this special program that you guys have been doing with these lots. Cool, man. Yeah. So basically, uh, these lots, when we bought them, they, they had curb and gutter and road to each lot and each alley. Uh, this is in the city of Burley. And so Burley, Idaho. Um, and so the way most of this happens here, they were city infill lots, part of the original, uh, Burley city town site. So they had existing utilities in the alleyways. The curb and gutter was already on the front, but it was basically just acting as, um, kind of a little hay field, um, honestly, that had hay planted in it, but nobody was irrigating it. It sat that way for 15 years, 20 years, you know. Wow. Um, There was an existing fourplex there uh, that the original developer before he went bankrupt had built. Um, And so in that purchase, my mother-in-law actually bought that fourplex uh, for herself. And then the family went together on the lots. 
Um, and so, yeah, they, they were basically ready to dig. Um, and so we, we really got to looking at it. My wife's a realtor. She wrote up the contract and we're all kind of brainstorming what we were going to do. Um, and the first concept was, uh, the Burley market was really just starting to kind of uh, blow up. And so you had Boise and Salt Lake or the, you know, we're halfway between Boise and Salt Lake. So you see what's happening in the Utah market and what's mm-hmm. going on in the Boise market. And it's like, man, like nothing's really happened in Burley. And so we thought, well, you know, it's just starting to get going. Um, housing prices are just starting to go up. Let's, let's build some spec houses first. So we took uh, five lots of the 17, um, and actually this time I was still working my engineering job. And so I was going to act as like kind of the, the high level check-in guy to kind of keep the builder honest, but the builder was going to do the day to day. Um, and so we hired him to build five spec houses for us and they completed that over like six to nine months. And so we were hitting the market like July and August of 2019, I believe 2019 or 2020. Um, and so we, we sold out our first four spec houses, um, and just sold those on the open market. And then at that point is when I really started getting the bug to build. And so my wife and I actually, um, bought the last house and kind of ruined our profit on, (laughs) on that house, you know, and, uh, moved into that to move home and and get going on, on the rentals. So then you you moved into one of the homes on the 17 lots you bought. Yep. Correct. Sold five of them, just took the the money from that to help fund the project. It sounds like, and maybe fund your own house. And then, uh, we're able to move into one of the lots. So that still leaves you with another, what, 11 lots that hadn't been, yeah, you still had something to do. Yeah. So it was, we sold four of the five houses and moved into the fifth one. So we have cool. 12, 12 lots left. Um, so we moved down here and just started construction right before we moved. I started my business, got everything lined up, started building my subcontractor pool. Um, and we, we started construction on um, a couple duplexes first. Uh, so we went after, uh, I kind of looked at the market to see what people, people were renting here. Um, and my other existing rentals that I had before are here in Burley as well. So I kind of had an idea from posting things for rent where, what the need was in the city. Yeah. So we went ahead and tried to go after, um, we built some two bed, two bath, um, duplexes, right about 1100 square feet. Um, and started a couple of those. We actually ended up pulling the trigger on six of them. So we had 12 units under construction, uh, going at one time. Um, so that was phase two. We finished those, you know, like our first one, we finished December of last year and the sixth building we finished right around July of last year. Uh, so we kind of trickled them through, you know, phased them out. Um, and, and now we're on, you were, you're, you, you held for rentals as opposed to selling them off as spectrum. Correct. Yep. Cool. So my wife and I, uh, picked up two of them. I got another brother-in-law that picked up two of them. Um, my mother-in-law bought one and then my sister-in-law bought one. So all family members ended up, uh, taking all of those. And so now we're on phase three, we're building, um, triplexes now. So we got another 12 units under construction. Um, and we just finished one yesterday, got tenants in. And so we'll trickle the others out, you know, here over next month or two. Man, it's really interesting because you hear about people, you know, dabbling with real estate on the side or eventually, you know, they get enough real estate, they're like, oh, I'm going to go full-time in real estate. Like, you built a whole business around <laughs> your, this one project, really, this, these 17 lots. You're like, I'm going to start a construction company. We're going to be builders. I'm going to be a GC, and we're going to do these. And you have this three-phase thing all about this one big project. Um, I, I think that's really cool, and it just goes, show, goes to show, like, there's a way to make it work. You know what I mean? And obviously – it's not turnkey. It's not passive. You didn't just say, you know, pay someone right. to just go build a bunch of stuff, but it's, man, it's put you in the driver's seat of your assets. And that's one of my big rules of investing is I want to be in control of the asset. And I love how much control you have over it, even to be able to keep it all in the family instead of if, 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 if they want to, you know what I mean? Which obviously they did. Um, that that's super cool. That's just a really interesting approach to do it. Do you do a lot of other work with J2 Homes outside of this project specifically? What's up, guys? It's Brody Fawcett. Hey, I just want to jump on here really quick and say thank you, thank you, thank you for tuning in and listening to the show week after week. It means so much to us. 
real quick, if you are getting value out of this, please go ahead and leave us a review and feel free to share this with anyone who else you think might receive some value. And if you feel like you could benefit from working with us directly through a one-on-one -on -one coach like Joe or through our trainings and online program, head on over to realestateinvestingschool.com where you can schedule a free one-on-one -on -one strategy call and dive in to see if Real Estate Investing School will add some value for you. We've done a couple little small remodels, you know, things like that. But um, at this point, we've been... I'm kind of real. I'm at that weird point in my business where um, I really wanted to solidify my my process and how I wanted things done exactly. And so I'm at that point. And now I've kind of hit my I'm at about 12, you know, 12 units under construction is about my limit right now. It's a lot. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we at this point, when we get moving forward, uh, I'd really like from the J2 home side of things, I'd really like to hire an employer to um, and kind of ramp that up so we could take on some more projects for other investors or uh, custom homes or, you know, whatever, whatever anybody's looking for, um, in sure. the construction space. So at this point, uh, not so much for other people besides kind of our own big, big project. That's awesome, man. And so you're finding ways to get these numbers to cash flow. then when you're renting out these duplexes and triplexes, I mean, you got a great deal on the land. You obviously have a hookup through with the builder cause you are the builder. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's, it's like, you've found a way to trim out overhead on every step of the process. And so they're coming out the other end as cash flowing new builds. Yeah. That's awesome. Do you yeah. just have a ton of equity in these? Or are you putting on some sort of debt that you're using to, to roll into other stuff or leverage or how, what are you doing with debt and leverage on these? Yeah. So what we did, um, <clears throat> it's kind of hit and miss, um, uh, various, uh, my sister-in-law and brother-in-law that owns one of them, they had actually sold a, uh, they had a primary residence in Boise that they, uh, moved out of and turned it into a rental for a year. So they sold that and took all their equity from that property and dumped it in a duplex, uh, to own outright. So a couple of them are owned outright, but most of us, what we've actually done is, uh, we yeah, use kind of our own money to fund the construction. Um, and then what we do is we go and, and pull out the money, do a 70% loan to value, kind of a burst strategy, but more for new construction, yeah. right? was the idea. <laughs> um, and so, and then what we did is we just take our appraised value. Um, as long as we can make the number still cash flow, the percentages and, and actual dollar amount monthly that we are looking for, then we'd pull out as much of that money as we could and roll it on to the next. So it sounds like you've, it's, in the way I'm hearing it, there's multiple ways you've really found capital to fund this project. One, you did the spec homes. You, you built yep. those. And did you just build those with like a construction loan and then turn around and sell them? Yeah. So that, well, that one, we, we pulled up some family money to, to cool. fund those as well. And then so we you guys actually funded the spec homes. Yep. And then we actually family money. Yep. And then we convinced the builder to carry two of them actually. So the builder here, um, he's one of the build bigger builders in the area. And so, uh, talking through them, we're like, Hey, we can either build three of them at a time, or if you want to go with all five of them, like we'd have to figure out a way to fund the other two. And he was basically just like, we'll just, we'll just fund it and negotiate some interest on the backside and, and then, uh, do it that way. And so that actually worked out really smooth. That's cool. And then when you started doing the duplexes, were you just family money self funding that as well on the front end to get it all built? And, and then you, you know, each of the family yeah. members ended up cashing out to, for things to cover the cost. Yeah. So we took a lot of the profit from those, uh, spec houses is what mm -hmm. helped us fund that. Right. And then we kind of played the balance game of, you know, duplex number one was kind of finishing up as duplex number four was getting started. And so we were kind of like, we could fund two, three, four of them at a time, kind of depending on the phase where they were at. Right. Um, and then we would pull money out of the first one and start the fourth building, you know, and then pull the money out of the second one that was getting refinanced yeah. and start the fifth building. And so it's kind of this like daisy chain of, of financing and moving the money around. And it <laughs> got confusing at times for sure, but it made it happen. So when you're getting these 70% cash out refinances when the project's done, is that enough to cover the cost of building it? Are you, are you getting all your money back out or are you leaving some in? We're, we're leaving some of it in. So one kind of interesting hurdle we ran into. So looking at the market here in Burley, there was a couple, like two multifamily projects that um, just two fourplexes that had sold 
a couple months before we started and they sold for like nine hundred thousand dollars to some investor out of northern Ooh. idaho and it was just like like that's boise and salt lake money you know i'm like yeah. man I, like looking at the numbers i'm like there's no way this guy's he's not leveraging these because it doesn't he couldn't even cash flow at three percent when rates were that right and so I know hey, you need to buy a couple more. We'll sell you some for yeah, 900. <laughs> exactly. So I knew it was 1031 money, but as I got to building, you know, I was kind of looking at their, his specs on that and trying to figure out where my duplexes were going to land in terms of appraised value. Mm -hmm. And so the goal kind of was to pull, to, to pull the full burst strategy and pull all of our money back out of it. And I thought that, that we could. Um, and then we got our first appraisal report back. <laughs> and uh, so we were building these all in land, everything for about 315 to 320. Um, and I was hoping we could get like 400 to 420 at appraised value and pull out almost all that money, if not all of it. Mm -hmm. um, and our first appraisal came back at 345. Oh, wow. And it was kind of a big punch in the gut, right? And we're like, this doesn't make any sense. Like even just looking at, I mean, when you look at the appraisal report, the issue is because it is small multifamily, two to four units. It has to go off comparable sales and multifamily doesn't trade down here other than those two buildings that were kind of outliers um, to the market. Like the last uh, comparable sale they had was a fourplex that I bought in 2018 that was on the report, <laughs> oh, you know, and this is 2021, you know, and so that that really hurt us on the appraised side but we did get our construction cost out of it so that was good right and just to kind of put it into per some perspective our first appraisal came back at 345 the second one bumped up to 365 those are the same appraisers then we got a new appraiser that that won the bid on the appraisal and our third building came in at 500,000 <laughs> And wow. yeah, and then our fourth one bumped back down to 400. So the appraisals were just all over just, the place, right? Dude, and that's and so, something that's so funny, man. We tell like appraisals are such a big, important part of refinances or, or buying or anything or selling it. You know, it's such a vital part of the whole process. And it's such baloney. Like it's yeah. so subjective. It's insane. And like your, your, you know, your story there just shows how subjective it really is. So I'm sure there's some appraisers listening to this being like, Hey, Joe, it's not like that, but I don't know, man. I think they're pretty damn subjective personally. I agree. I just looking at them again, not an appraiser. I know it's a hard job, but looking at, at these reports, it was like, this makes zero sense to me looking at a comparable sale on a house that's about 1800 square feet, two bed, two bath, has a garage, whatever. And they're using that as a comparable sale on a duplex that brings in money every month, right? The mortgage is covered every single month and they're valuing those properties at the same value. It doesn't, you know, for me. And you look at the, the section of the appraisal report that says, you know, if you do it based on uh, the business side of things, the, the rental side um, based on cap rate, the value, the value of the building is $450,000 but they can only attribute a certain percentage of that method to the full overall appraisal. And it, it's super yeah. confusing, right? But it, it, it was a little frustrating at the time. And but See exactly what they're going to look for so you can make it look the way they want it to look. And, and you know, that's something I just did a podcast yesterday with Luke Hoffman. Um, and we talked about this on the lender side, meeting with your lender going, what do you want to see? And then just mm -hmm. finding the project that they want to fund, you know, building the project that will appraise, you know, like say, go to the sources that are going to be affecting you and see what they want and, and do everything you can to have it just fit what they're already looking for. Um, I, I think there's a lot of power in that. Right. Yeah. We also looked at uh, one, one thing we were thinking about was maybe even though someone in the family wanted to own all those duplexes, we really thought about listing one of them and, um, you know, listen it a little bit high at the competitive rate of what the market was in 2021 um, and seeing if we could get it, get it under contract and sold for 400, 450, somewhere in there. So just so we had a comparable sale, you know, yeah. and then, then there was no argument because they're the exact same buildings, you know, um, but we decided against that. I've actually heard of these big companies doing that, like Open Door and some of these like big conglomerate companies, they'll buy up. 20 homes in an area i was like why are they buying so many so they can sell these ones off even at really high rates just to raise the comparables for the ones they'll sell later which which is you know that's big play tricky stuff right. but but it does happen so i i like where your head's at 
Well, that's awesome, man. So, so you're in the middle of the triplex phase then of the, the final lots. Yep. Correct. We actually, um, we picked up a couple extra lots through, through the years. So instead of 17, we had, uh, 19 lots. So cool. once we finish these triplexes, we'll have, uh, four additional lots left as kind of the last phase that we're hoping to hammer out this spring. Um, and we're still kind of in the development phase of that as to what exactly we're, we're going to do with those lots. If they're going to be triplexes, duplexes, spec houses, you know, or single family to rent. So we're kind of playing with the numbers to see what makes sense right now. Have, so have you held on to all of the duplexes? Yep. Um, and you only, so you only sold the, sold the first four specs and everything else you guys have held on to or, or kept in the family and are living in or, or renting. Correct. Man, I just, I just love the concept of like, you found this one thing of these lots and you're like, let's go all in on this. And now it's 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 housing half your family. It's it's providing work for you for years. You right. know what I mean? And and just so much can come out of just taking advantage of an opportunity. You know what I mean? I just think that's so crazy to see how much can come from jumping on something like that and going. Well, and one thing to keep in mind that's <clears throat> that's kind of interesting that I didn't realize at the time, but af after we got going, it's it's been a huge uh, blessing for us. Is um, you know, since I am the builder, when I, when I get ready to refinance these properties, there's a portion of, you know, I I'm, this is my business. I, I take home a check from building these, right? Right. So yeah. on my own buildings, you know, I build them for three fifteen. Well, I may have charged $30,000 or something to, to, uh, manage that construction. And so at my down payment of 70, $80,000, that's supposed to be left in the deal. Well, 30,000 of that is as minus sweat equity anyways. And so mm -hmm. that's, that's helped for, for my wife and I personally, who's doing the actual physical uh, work on it is we get a little bit of a benefit where, you know, we might not get to do the full burr strategy and pull out all of our money, but there is a portion of sweat equity that's left in the deal that I'm okay with leaving um, because it's less money out of our pocket. Yeah, I, I think that's super cool. It's the same concept. Like, yeah, if you're the real estate agent or the builder, you know, there's these other these built-in costs that you're paying yourself. Correct. That, you know, which and and you're working for it though. I mean, you're this isn't passive. That's active. You need to pay yourself. You need to count that time in. But at the end of the day, it's like, you know, that's not cash. You're having to find somewhere else because Correct. it's coming in. You know, which which is super cool. Um, that's great, man. Well, let, let's go back in time a little bit because that, that's a big that's a big project to have the confidence to to bite off. So how let's go backwards and figure out how did you get from, you know, you know, whatever, how you first got. Well, I want to learn how, learn how you first got introduced to real estate and why you thought it was interesting. And then take us from that to your first deal to the point where you felt confident in in quitting your job and building a whole building, you know, tackling this whole project that you just explained for us. So let's go back in time. You're in college, you start studying real estate. How did you get the spark started for it? And what, how'd that lead to your first deal? Yeah. So <clears throat> started a little bit before that, but in college is when I really, really knew I could do something and, and maybe tackle a property. So, um, my wife's mom actually is who got me interested in real estate. So my wife and I dated in high school um, and my wife's dad passed away when she was 11. <clears throat> and so my mother-in-law, um, you know, just barely widowed, need to figure it out, needed to figure out what she was going to do, how to provide for her kids um, and stuff like that. And so mm -hmm. she, um, her brother, it was a realtor kind of getting ready to get into the real estate investing world and said, Hey, you know, you should really look at buying some rental properties. And so she actually took uh, Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad, Poor Dad's uh, class, you know, back in 2005, six, seven, somewhere in there and bought the That's Rich awesome. Dad, Poor Dad cash flow board game. And, you know, so I, I'd be, uh, you know, hanging out with my wife in high school and my mother-in-law would be like, hey, let's play this board game, you know, and kind of teaches you the basics of how to actually cash flow from assets and stuff. Um, and I remember at the time, uh, when my wife and I were dating, uh, like kind of asking her, so like, how does your mom make money? Like she doesn't go to a job every day, you know, yeah. like, you know? And so I'm like, 
and my wife would be like, uh, you know, she's a real estate investor. She owns rental properties. And I'm like, okay, okay. You know, like no idea what that is. Right. Let that yeah. for a while, weeks, months later, whatever. I'm like, but how does she make money though? You know, <laughs> yeah, like, that's, that's cool. Yeah. yeah she owns so, property. So exactly. But, you know, but what's her job? <laughs> yeah. And so I'm like, okay, yeah. But how does that actually, so then like through questioning and kind of over years and stuff of like, okay, like, oh, okay, I get it now. So you own the property, they rent it, covers the mortgage plus some blah, blah, blah. Got it. So, and then, you know, in college, that's when I really, you know, I'm in my junior year of college, really realizing, you know, hey, I'm going to get out and and have a a decent job and as a mechanical engineer and make decent money. So um, I'm going to start learning. And uh, so my brother-in-law and I really started like driving, looking for properties and trying, you know, going and looking at uh, open houses and talking with agents and all that stuff. Um, But it took me, you know, I didn't have any real money in college. um, And this is before all this super creative stuff is mainstream, you know, where you can Mm -hmm. take over people's loans or owner finance and all that. So I had no idea about that. I thought I had to come up with all 25% down, you know, Um, and so got out of school, got my job, wife and I got married, started saving up some money and, and just stuck in the analysis paralysis for years. It felt like, and finally found a property that checked all the boxes that actually hit the market, um, on Christmas morning (laughs) and I'm a Zillow addict. So I, I saw it right. And called my realtor the next day and said, we need to buy this property. And that was the first one that, that we, we took down. Did you, did you reach out on Christmas? No, I waited yeah. till the next day. <laughs> okay, I'm like, who's first of all, who's listing on Christmas morning? But then I'm like, and I guess we know who's finding it. Is, right. It's you. Exactly. Um, I'm like, is there an agent available to put an offer in on Christmas day? Yeah, exactly. Can we go see this property right now, please? <laughs> <laughs> hey, are you done eating? Uh, are you done opening presents? I got to go somewhere. Yeah. Um, that's great. So that that's cool. You found that and you you bought that property um and so that was just listed on on zillow list yep. on the mls you you went and you just bought it when you put the 20 25 down just bought it as a traditional investment just turnkey kind of rental yep exactly so that one was a um severely uh under rented um and so it came on the market it was a fourplex it came on the market at uh, 225 i think is what we bought it for i offered them full price and i think at the time uh, one unit was renting for 200 bucks and the other three rent wow. units were renting for 400, I believe. And so okay. we, we bought it and ran the numbers that, you know, Hey, if we could stabilize these rents and get it up to market value at six fifty or seven, like, I, I think we could, you know, do good on it. And, um, of course, because you're stuck in that analysis paralysis for so long, like I was super conservative in my numbers and, it's been a great deal for us, you know, as we increase rents and stuff, but um, yeah, the return was way higher than I originally calculated, you know, cause I was throwing in all this extra CapEx and property management and just all the thing. What if this goes wrong and that goes wrong because I was brand new, you know? And so yeah, then good. you get into it and it's like, huh? Like, yeah, I guess I should save some money off to the side for capital expenditures, but I mean, I get to take that and put it in my bank account for now, you know, so yeah. you're, you know, until something happens. So that was, that was nice to learn right off the bat. Well, I love that you did it right. Like you, you, you counted all of that in to your cost to make sure it would still be self-sufficient, would still cash flow, even with all the CapEx vacancies and management fees, blah, 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 blah. But like you said, and here's the dirty little secret that you never want to run your numbers on, but at the end of the day, it's kind of a nice thought is appreciation can yeah. kind of cover all of that, you know, over time. Not all, not, not always, especially people buying right now, you know, 8% of homes bought in the past two years or underwater, you know what I mean? So home values are going down right now, you know, but overall, before you have to replace a roof, especially if it's a newer build, you're going to have enough appreciation in that to cover that. You know what I mean? And and you don't have to necessarily truly be putting that money for your CapEx aside in a bank account for 20 years. Like I said, you can use that money, you can invest that money in the and the the equity in the home from appreciation can kind of cover a lot of its own stuff down the road. And and again, I wouldn't run my numbers that way. I wouldn't calculate my cash on cash return that way. I, I still keep cash reserves and I, I do all that to be smart and safe. But it's just one more way that real estate's forgiven. Absolutely. That's cool, man. So you you buy that fourplex. That's your first investment property. 
Um, and you've been playing with it for years, the idea of buying, but you know, finally you had a good job. You had some money, you felt confident enough to pull the trigger. Um, and then how many more did you buy before diving into this, uh, this big burly project with the, the 17 lots? Yeah, we bought a couple, a couple flips in there, uh, and flipped some houses, just two of them, I think is all we did. Um, so that gained a little bit of experience. And then, uh, we ended up buying another triplex that had two big shops on. So kind of a five door, uh, a property. Um, so we bought that one and then, uh, that was, I think in 2019. And then we basically been doing about one a year scattered in some flips and then, um, yeah, then it was just like, it's time. Let's do it. Let's go for it. And, and one thing to know is, um, you know, for anybody out there getting started and stuff is part of the reason I was able to quit my job and go and do this was because of buying those first two rentals. Right. So yeah. at the time, you know, we were cash flowing maybe 1200 bucks a month on the fourplex and 2000 bucks a month on the triplex. So bringing in $3,000 a month, um, in, passive income. And so looking at our financials and stuff, as you're getting ready to quit your job, that creates a huge buffer, you know, for you and your family as you're getting ready to go. You're not eliminating all your income to zero right off the bat because my wife's a realtor. So it's all dependent on sales. Right. And I'm the one that had the stable income. And so it was yeah. nice to have those some form of income coming in regardless of what I was doing during the day. So I could go and take this leap of faith and go and try and start this self-employment journey. Um, and not not just completely drain the savings account. <laughs> yeah, no, and, and man, it's it's so powerful. Even just that little bit, like you said, you know, it's like, I mean, and, and it's not that little. I mean, 3000 that's a lot of people's, you know, their whole monthly income. You know, obviously you're probably a little used to a little more than that, you know, with uh, being a, an engineer and everything like that. But the, I always say cash flow gives you that freedom mm -hmm. to pivot, to make that choice where your bases are covered so that you can. And and it's just so crazy how that is a reality that you can just buy yeah. these things and they provide you the opportunity to just go take these bigger risks, these bigger moves and still be okay, still be comfortable right. enough to do that. Um, and it sounds like your wife was working as well as an agent, so that definitely probably didn't hurt. No, it definitely helped out. But that being said, Joe, that's a big jump to go from, hey, I've bought a couple of cash flow properties, done a couple little flips to I'm going to quit my job, start a building and and go develop this entire neighborhood virtually. <laughs> you know, where where does that where does that come from the confidence or the knowledge or the preparation? Like how do you know you're ready to do that because that's a big deal? Yeah, so my my job uh, is an engineer. I was a mechanical engineer. I worked for a design firm in Boise. And so what we did was we designed food plants. Um, and so a, a majority of what I was doing was designing piping systems for these big food plants for their hot water and steam and chilled water and all that stuff to, to process all of our food. A lot of uh, French fry potato processing plants. And um, I remember me and, and one of my coworkers were working on a project um, and just our mechanical, uh, our mechanical design budget was like $2 million. And we were designing mm -hmm. these huge pipe racks and there was one lead engineer over us. And we were engineers that had two, three years experience, pretty young engineers. And um, me and this other coworker were, were the main guys pumping out all the design documents. And when they had problems in the field, uh, they were calling us, you know, what, why is this drawing say this? Why, you know, why'd you guys call this out on the drawing? What, this doesn't match up, you know? So we were the ones out there trying to get this pipe rack built. And here we are at 20, you know, two years old designing millions of dollars worth of, of, um, construction. And that's really probably what gave me the confidence to do it because, yeah. um, you know, you had this older engineer that's kind of checking your work and making sure the design was there so that we didn't get into a bind later, but the actual construction side, when the guys are calling up and you've got to explain what's on the page and what, what you were uh, envisioning really gives you the confidence to like, Hey, residential, I, not that it's easy, but um, it's also with your own company, you don't have 
uh, someone else breathing down your neck for deadlines. Yeah. You know, if it takes six months to build one or eight months, like it doesn't really matter. We'll work through the problems, you know, and that's one nice thing in, in construction, remodels, flips, it, it, you know, anything we do in the real estate investing world, it's like anything you mess up can be fixed. I mean, I'm sure you've walked properties that are absolutely like <laughs> terrible looking, right? And someone comes in here and flips it and makes it look immaculate, right? Yeah. It just costs a little bit of money. So between those two things, and, and honestly, I have to give a lot of credit to my wife. She, you know, I'm definitely a lot more conservative and maybe worried about, oh man, like financially worried. Like what, what if we don't make any money? And what if we get in a bind or this and that? And she just kind of looked at me one day and said, you absolutely can do this. Like, just go do it. You know, like we'll figure it out as we go. And so having someone behind you that believes in you yeah. as well is, is super powerful. Cause it's like, yeah, I think we can do it. Let's go for it then. That's cool. I, I love that. Yeah. I, I think there's a lot of power of having support, you know, like that. And, and, and then, like you said, man, when, when you've done hard things, other things that aren't even in the same realm, just, you just know it's doable. You know, mm -hmm. you're running these huge projects, like you're explaining, you're just like, yeah, I don't know this side, but like, I've done big, complicated projects. Like, I know that I can figure it out. You know right. what I mean? Absolutely. And that's one thing I've been realizing a lot lately, like that people think that the professional knows all the answers. And it's like, no, the professional just has more resources to troubleshoot and figure it out as they go. Exactly. <laughs> like, yeah. Like that is the brutal truth of, of everything, you know, whatever it is, but you know, real estate investing is obviously what I do. And a lot of times a lot of students are like, what about this? What do I do about this? And I'm like, man, I don't, I don't know. But if it were my project, this is how I would figure it out. You Absolutely. know what I mean? And that's really what it takes. And that's what you guys did is, you, you know, like you, like your wife was saying, like, well, well, the things we don't know, we'll figure it out. But let's just bet on us and go for it. Absolutely. And being willing to check your pride at the door and pick up the phone and call somebody, you know, you don't mm -hmm. have to know it all. You know, that's that's part of what's awesome about social media these days and uh, ha being able to be connected with people all over the country, really. And it's, you see something on there and it's like, oh, man, that's that's interesting. And like, I, how do you figure that out and being able to message them and get in contact with them or get on the phone with them to to, uh, yeah, help solve some of your problems is is really awesome. Yeah, and, and I, I'm a big fan of that, like putting your pride aside. I, I'm not, I hate people who like talk big and try to puff themselves up. You know, it's like, dude, just do what you need to do to learn. I don't really care. You know, I've done a lot of deals, but there still be times I'll be talking to a lender or a seller and they use some abbreviation that like, I feel like I should know. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. but I'm like, what is QRD? They're like, oh, the quality of it. And you're like, okay, cool. Like, yeah, yeah. That was one I had either never heard or didn't remember. But you just, yeah, like I said, put your pride aside, get the clarification, find out what it is from the lenders, from the sellers, from all, all these different sources. There's always going to be more things that uh, that you don't know. You know what Absolutely. I mean? Absolutely. But that's cool, man. So so you, uh, I, I love the story. I love everything we've covered so far of how you've got there with your journey. What's kind of the next move for you guys as you uh, – you know, you finish out this project, you wrap up these 19 lots, you know, you've now got quite a portfolio of rental properties, especially compared to when you started, you know, what's going to be the next phase that you would like to see um, in, in your business and in your investing portfolio um, after that? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, I've kind of been, as I've gotten into more and more construction, I've been really interested in... Um, kind of some of the higher performance builds. Um, I'd be really interested to take my business more towards high performance builds or custom homes. Um, but I also, uh, rental properties are near and dear to my heart, right? So I kind of yeah. feel this tug and pull. So I'm kind of, I've got two different uh, thoughts. I, I keep thinking about going and, and building some nicer homes, um, but maybe starting a smaller, uh, you know, subsidy off my company that, that focuses on the, the multifamily rentals, um, and kind of keep both of them going. Um, so we've got some other land we're looking at, uh, here in town and, uh, that's eight more lots. So we're kind of, uh, pursuing some more projects down in this area, but kind of keeping a, a close eye on what's going on in the market and rental rates and particularly interest rates. Cause 
right now in our market, um, the average uh, couple can't really afford a home with the interest right. at six and a half percent because of the, the run up in prices. So right now is a good time for us to be building. Um, but we're just kind of watching to see and kind of wrap, you know, get closer to wrapping this project up and see where all the finances are and if we need to bring in a partner to tackle the next one. That's cool. Yeah, that I, I could definitely see uh, how that all plays out. And, you know, it's, it's interesting, like say, you, the passion of wanting to go do these fancy ones, but then also like, ah, the, the rentals, yeah. you know, and maybe you'll find a way to do both, but I, I can definitely see the pull there. Yeah, I keep thinking um, maybe I'll go build nice custom homes to make the money and then just build rentals for myself. <laughs> Yeah, and and that's the way to do it, right? Like that's that's what you encourage a lot of people. If you have the active income, go make your money with your active income, and then pour it into your rental properties. Because yep. you know, like I say, there are creative ways to do these. You know, seller finance and sub two and zero down. You know, but man, if you can just put twenty percent down, is buy the freaking thing, <laughs> then you're done. You know, what I mean, right. it's not complicated. Yeah, no. if you have some money in your pocket, Absolutely. and so if you can find a way, it might be simpler to make money. Than to try to buy a house zero down, you know. Absolutely. I mean? um, and then you have equity in it, and there's a lot of benefits of of doing it that way as well, which is which is super cool. And, and that's what's the thing that's so fun about the real estate game is it's, it's just never done. You can just keep playing. You know what I mean? Like you get more, you build your portfolio, and then you can just keep building it and do this and do that and do more pet projects, and you know the sky's the limit with it. Yeah. That's sweet, man. Have you had any um, failures? Like, have you had any deals that just really went south? Um, I think we learn a lot from our failures, um, maybe more than our successes. Um, but I think we can learn a lot from success. People always say you can't learn from success. I'm like, I think you can learn a lot from it. I love learning from success instead of failures. Yeah, it's a um, lot more fun to learn from success than failures. <laughs> for sure. You know what I mean? Um, but do you have any failures? Have you ever been like totally burned? Um, tell us about any of your failures if you've had any. So we're kind of working through one right now. Um, and I think we, we might get off the hook a little lucky on this one. So you know, we're talking about having the confidence to come and, and take on a huge project like this. And, you know, but we, we're we brand new to this. My my mother-in-law, the family, my wife, all of us hadn't taken on a development project. And so we bought this ground um, and on the northern uh, boundary of these 17 lots, there was a road that's been dirt road for 15 years. Mm -hmm. So we bought the ground, got to going, doing our thing. You know, we're on phase three of our project, getting ready to start into phase four. And that just happens to be all the lots against this dirt road. So I start, you know, getting in with the permit office and, hey, we're going to pull permits on these. We're looking at building some more rentals. Um, and they're like, pump the brakes, buddy. You, uh, that road, according to the subdivision ordinance, you need to pave that road. And ah. so we're kind of like, ooh, like, uh, well, we didn't know that, you know. And so we've been arguing back and forth with the city trying to figure out the exact rules and if there's precedent from other situations in town that we don't have to actually pave that road because the road that accesses the property is paved. I mean, people can get to their property and this road, it's a low traveled road. It's got dead ends on both sides, you know, like it's like there's no real huge benefit of putting it in other than the side of the house would now have this paved road. Um, and so that one, that one might bite us a little bit uh, cause we'll actually end up spending more money on paving the road than each lot cost us. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, but like I said, we might get off a little bit lucky just because of the run up and asset prices and other properties, um, other lots in town are selling for, about the amount we'd be into it after paving the road. And that's mm. just because we've sat on them for almost th three years now, you know? Um, so we'll see how that one ends up and what the true cost really is. It could cost us some money, but, um, and really lower our returns on those properties. And that kind of plays into our, you know, our approaches and our strategy as to what we're going to do down there is if we need to try and recoup some of that money by building something to sell or if uh, if we can kind of bite the bullet and just let it be and have, take a lower return on those ones. Yeah, and, and it's super cool, man. I love – that's one thing I love about real estate is there's so many different options, 
right? If you do run into these unforeseen things and it, the money's not going to work out as a long hold, yeah, maybe maybe you sell one or two of them. You know what I mean? And that's a bummer. Now they're not in your portfolio, but it funds the project. And maybe you put an extra cup, some cash in your pocket, which isn't the worst thing in the world. You know what I mean? A lot of these failures end up being, you know, they're still wins. You know right. what I mean? Yeah. Um, honestly, I think the only failures I've heard of when I've asked this question is people flipping houses and, and it just, you know, they, it dragged on, it cost too much and they're underwater and they, they take a loss on, you know, yep. flipping houses. That's, that's a lot less forgiving Absolutely. than, um, you know, portfolio building and, and long hold cash flow stuff that, that we're talking about, you know? So that's interesting. That that's definitely a big deal to have to figure out, you know, paving an entire road for sure. That's sweet, man. Well, awesome. Do you have any specific kind of uh, guiding principles or habits that you feel have kind of helped assist you along the way or just anything else you'd like to share before we kind of wrap up? Yeah. Um, no real guiding habit or principle. I'd just say you got to put the work in. You know, it's not I, me and one of my buddies. Um, he's a builder over in Idaho Falls. Shout out to Luke. We were kind of joking um, a couple months ago. It's like, man, you know, this passive real estate thing's fun, but it's not so passive, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. like, um, so you got to put in the work. You really got to understand your numbers. You got to build the network. You got to, you know, have the conversations. You can't just listen to a podcast one day about how powerful investing in real estate is and buy a property the next, you know, I mean, if you want to put yeah. your money in a syndication or something great, but, um, yeah, if you want to, if you want to get the full benefit of the asset and, and own it and, and stabilize it and all of that, you got to put the work in. And so, and the work's not always fun. You know, there's, there's days that absolutely suck. And, uh, as you're working through it, but when you, you take a step back and look at the broader spectrum of everything, it's, it's a pretty awesome asset class to own. And, and it's a fun process to work through. Yeah. And, and the work, you know, you say you got to put the work in, you know, it's, it's not just like it, a lot of it is that mental work of running these numbers, understanding these things, figuring out like your blind spots. It's not, it's not, it's not always clear cut work. And that's what makes it tricky. That's what makes it difficult. It's not like, Hey, go swing a hammer, put the right. manual labor in. There's times where you got to do that, especially yeah. as you build there. But it's like, do the work of figuring out what you don't know how to figure out that you don't know you need to figure out, but you need to figure it out, but you don't even know what it is. Right. Yeah. What? Yeah, <laughs> like, exactly. That's the work, you know? Um, but it does get more clarity the more you do it, being able to run those numbers, understand. And then, and then like I said, it gets you 80% of the way there and then 20%, you're just going to have to figure it out. As a ghost. You, you know, <laughs> you just, you, you, you can't wait till all the lights are green before leaving your home, but make sure you have a running car and you got gas and, and then, then go for it and you'll figure out the rest as you go. Exactly. I love it, man. Um, well, sweet. We'll, we'll, we'll kind of, uh, roll out. We've got our kind of end off questions that we, we like to ask everybody. Um, I'm shaking them up a little bit for you though. So one, you won't be prepared for, but, but yeah, man, this is exciting. Um, I'm excited. Is there, before we do those, or is there, is there a way that people can keep following you if they want to either partner with you or, or just see your projects or keep in touch? Yeah. You can hit me up on Instagram. I got, a. Uh... My personal page is at Joe Farron or my business page is at J2 Homes um, or Facebook. Yeah. Or you can shoot me an email. Um, it's just my name, hotmail.com. Um, still rocking the hotmail. Yeah. And uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I'd love to uh, connect with anybody that's looking for a uh, builder to build more mu small multifamily or just bounce ideas off each other. It's super powerful to get in a little group and be able to uh bounce ideas off each other and help each other out through this this wild game for sure it's such a community sport you know this real estate investing the more the merrier um and so the the j2 homes just the letter j the number two and then homes um and joe farron j-o-e-f-e-r-r-i-n if you want to follow joe farron uh at instagram um, well, that's awesome. Well, let's dive into it, man. So the first question I have for you before we go, what is a non-real estate related bucket list item you're excited to check off next? Yeah, man, I have always wanted to learn Spanish. Um, studied it in high school, college, you know, got the Duolingo doing my thing and uh, in the industry I'm in. 
speaking Spanish would be very um, powerful and helpful. Um, so my wife and I have talked a lot about um, maybe doing an immersion course down in Costa Rica or getting down somewhere where we could go down there for a month or six weeks and, mm. and really immerse in it and try and learn the language. That would be a really cool way to do it. Um, I've always wanted to speak another language, but I never wanted to learn it. It seems really intimidating yes. to me. Um, but when you do it that way, you go live in Costa Rica for a few months, uh, get immersed fully. That that seems like a cool way to do it. I like that. Yeah. That's great, man. Um, all right. So question number two, what book are you currently reading? Mm, what book am I currently reading? Um <clears throat> I'd have to get my phone out and actually look at which one I'm listening to right now. Um, uh, that's, a, that's a new question. I popped yeah. it on you. You weren't prepared for that yeah, one. I, I was like looking at the questions like, I want to shake it up today. Yes. So. But one, I can definitely um, recommend a book that changed my uh, opinion about working for corporate, owning your own business and really ramping up my um, investment side is um, it's called Family Revision written by uh, Jeremy Pryor. So my wife and I are, really uh, interested in the vision for our family and, and multi-generational legacy and wealth. Um, and so this book is kind of an interesting look at um, owning assets and businesses and just um, from a, from a Jewish culture perspective, from a uh, old Testament perspective. So it's oh, super, yeah, super interesting book and kind of how the Jewish people were raised uh, to think about money and business. Um, and uh, yeah, there's a reason that, uh, Jewish families are some of the most wealthiest families out there. So um, that's an interesting book for sure. That's cool. What was the name of it again? It's called Family Revision. Family Revision. Awesome. Yeah, everybody check that one out. I haven't heard of that recommendation yet. There's a lot of real estate books out there. Um, this one's more like a, a, this one's not real estate specific, it sounds like. Yeah, correct. It's more just like family, family. And it really changed my mind about like, you know, cause I thought I was a corporate guy forever, you know, like I just need to mm -hmm. provide, I'm gonna put my head down, worked on 65 and that's what it's going to be. But really changing my mind as to like, uh, being around my kids as they grow up, you know, being able to pop in and yeah. out of the house during the day and say, hi, see what's going on, you know, but still get your work done and not being bound to that nine to five or eight to five where you're just out of the house for the majority of the day, you know? Yeah, I love that. I love that. Yeah, man, there's something about working from home, like say, even though those five minute little bumps here, 10 mm -hmm. minutes bump there, you know, and even if you're working quite a bit, those little interjections can be powerful. I, even just hearing them giggle in the other room when <laughs> I'm in my office working, like I love it, you know, absolutely it's something special. Um, well, sweet, man. All right. So last question. If you were to send a text message to the world, what is everybody going to hear from Joe Farron? Man, that's a tough one, but I'd maybe just say like, get out there and build a life you love, you know, um, life's too short. Uh, man, it just seems like more and more people, you know, run into these illnesses or family members, things that just terrible things out there. And so I just like get out there and change it no matter what your circumstance is and where you're starting from, just take a small step towards, you know, where you want to end up today and just keep compounding those uh, actions over and over and over. And when you, when you get done, you'll look back and realize that um, life's pretty awesome. And uh, so get out there and build it. I love it, man. Well, sweet, sweet. So much. Thanks so much for your time. This was super fun to hear your story. Not everybody is, is doing what you're doing. Um, I need you to build some new build rentals for me. I, I, I'd love that. So we'll have to chat about Let's that. Let's do it, later. man. But sweet man, well, without any further ado, this is Joe Jensen signing off for the Real Estate Investing School podcast, reminding you to bet on yourself, do the work, and go for it.